Well, we are returning to our Elephant in the Room series this morning, and the topic that we're dealing with is domestic violence. Uh, I've asked uh, some whether or not this is getting too negative, and they said, well, if it's an elephant in the room that's good, we want to talk about it. And that's true. But the idea behind this series is we're talking about these topics that exist even among us that nobody wants to talk about, but that we need to talk about. About three weeks ago, three or four weeks ago, I came across an article uh, that actually was the purpose, and it actually triggered me into putting this sermon in this series. The article was explaining a recent poll that had been conducted in Germany, uh, and the information that was gained from that poll, it was a surveying men between the ages of 18 to 35, and from those men between the ages of 18 to 35, one in three said that it was acceptable to be violent toward your spouse in order to instill respect in them. That caught me a little off guard. So I thought maybe that what I ought to do is I ought to look at our own culture and our own country and research a little bit of the data here to see whether or not we're finding the same kind of statistics here. And here's what I found. More than one out of every three women and more than one out of every four men in the United States will experience rape, physical violence, and or stalking by an intimate partner in their lifetime. And by the way, based on everything that I have ever studied on this topic, I do believe that those statistics are incredibly conservative because all we're dealing with is what's actually reported. And this happens to be an elephant in the room that's really not reported that awful well. One in three of the women and one in four of the men. Nearly 20 people per minute are physically abused by an intimate partner in the United States. 20 people per minute. That adds up to more than 10 million women and men a year. One out of every four women and one out of every seven men have experienced severe physical violence by an intimate partner during their lifetime. On a typical day in the United States, there are 20,000 calls placed to a domestic, abuse, a domestic violence hotline. And I say again, everyone who studies the topic said these are just the statistics that are reported. But there are a lot more that are not reported than there are that are reported. And most sobering for me, out of all of these statistics is the fact that those who profess to be Christians and those who do not profess to be Christians don't show up differently in the polls. And what I mean by that is those who profess to be Christians have the same statistics on the topic of domestic violence as those who do not profess that. And so we've got to talk about it because it's likely in this room it's likely in some of our homes. And if we know that it exists, and if we know that it's a problem, then we need to know what God says about it. And we need to know what we need to do about it. So I want to start with the question of a definition. What is domestic violence? And I, I know I shouldn't have to define that, but unfortunately I think that I do because I want us to narrow it down for our purposes this morning, and I want us to... What I'm talking about this morning is physical acts of aggression between spouses or uh, someone in a family relationship. And the emphasis that I'm placing there is on the physical, and there's a reason for that. I'm not saying that verbal abuse is not a bad thing. I'm not saying that mental abuse is not a bad thing. What I'm saying is, yes, those are very serious problems, but in order for us to consider the topic of abuse... We kind of have to do with it, deal with it in a measurable way. And mental and verbal abuse is not so easy to measure. As an example, how many bad words does it take to get to the level of abuse? One or two 
or 12. So you get to a place where you can't really define what you're talking about. And so I believe that by dealing with the, the, the definable area of physical abuse, then we can set forth some principles that help us to apply it to the other areas as well, mental and verbal abuse. I also want to recognize that application has to go further than just between spouses. We're talking about between spouses, but it's not limited to that. Domestic violence occurs between parents and children, parents abusing their children, sometimes children even abuse, abusing their parents. We need to be concerned about these things. We need to apply these principles that we're going to study today to that area as well. But what I'm dealing with, what I'm trying to narrow us down to understand is physical violence, what it means and what we need to do with it. Those who study this describe a cycle. They talk about a cycle of domestic violence, or they talk about a cycle of abuse, which kind of gives you the idea of repetition, right? You're familiar with the idea of a cycle. You remember all the way back with uh, the children of Israel when they're living during the period of the judges, that, that whole time frame is a cycle. It's like they're a wheel just rolling along, and they keep repeating the same mistakes and ending up in the same place, and God brings them back when they turn turn back to him, and then they go right back down the same cycle again. Well, it works that way with domestic violence as well. It kind of rolls like this. You, tension starts to build in the family, and then somebody acts out in a violent way, and they feel guilty about it. They feel bad, and so they, they talk about being sorry. They're sorry, and this will never happen again, and so everything goes back to a good place for a little while, and then tension builds, and it's a repeated cycle. There are some things that we have to fear about this cycle. First of all, the specialists say that it seldom ends. It seldom ends as long as the relationship is intact. It can end if people will get help, but it rarely does end. And that's because, second of all, it doesn't ever get better on its own. If somebody is involved in an abusive situation, whether you are the abuser or the one being abused, it's not going to stop on its own. It just doesn't work that way. And so there has to be some kind of outside help so that people can overcome their struggles. And that won't happen until we're willing to admit that we've got the problem. And third, and maybe worst of all, is that it almost always escalates over time. Meaning that if you have been abused and your significant other has apologized for this and have sought no help about it, you can expect that when the tension builds again and the abuse comes again, it's not just going to be what it was before. It's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. I'm a little old-fashioned. I do like to joke around about being a chauvinist. I like to tell jokes about women. For example, recently I used Revelation chapter 8 and verse 1, and uh, the text talks about how that when the seventh seal was opened, there was silence in heaven about the space of a half an hour, and I said that must mean there are no women there for a while. I like to tell jokes like that. It keeps me in trouble. That's where I'm comfortable. But I'm a little bit old-fashioned, and I think there's a certain level of dignity and respect that's due to our wives. In fact, I think there's a certain level of dignity and respect that's due to all women. And I still open a door for a woman if I'm in the vicinity, and I let her go in first, and it doesn't matter if I know who she is or not. If we're on the Titanic, she's getting on the lifeboat. That's just the way it works. That's not being patronizing. That's an attitude that I was taught as I was growing up, and I wasn't just told it, I was shown it by two grandfathers and a father who that's the way they lived. And so that's the way I was taught. And so I'll say this very plainly. Any woman who's being abused, or for that matter, any man who's being abused, and any child who's being abused, and any parent who's being abused, if that's happening, it's got to stop. You're not expressing your superiority. You're expressing your weakness. And it's got to stop. 
And it's easier for me to apply it to the men toward the women because of my old-fashioned background, but it applies in any area. And so I've got to ask the question, if I know how bad this is, if I know the circumstances, then what can I do from it as, a, as far as a biblical perspective is concerned? Is there anything that the Bible says that can help me to, to understand this topic a little bit better? Well, yes, there is. There is. I think that there are a lot of us who understand the elements here. I think there are a lot of us who know and how to define domestic violence. We know what it looks like, but I don't think that we know so much about what the Bible says about it. So I'm going to ask you to turn to Ephesians chapter 5. I, I just got a couple of little passages to look at that I think are principles that should apply to our relationships. And if we do apply them to our relationships, then they're certainly going to help us to recognize the sinfulness of domestic violence. Ephesians chapter 5, I'm going to read verses 25 through 29. And by the way, in this chapter, Paul's writing about the church, but in writing about the church, he talks about the husband and wife relationship as the ideal so that they could understand it. And so in Ephesians 5, beginning in 25, he says this. He says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. So in the picture of what the home is supposed to look like, which is supposed to teach us about the relationship between Christ and the church, he says that husbands are supposed to take care of their wives and they're supposed to nourish them just like they do their own body. He says nobody ever hated their own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it. And that's right after he says that's the way you're supposed to be toward your spouse. And he says, so husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. The idea behind the language in this particular text actually kind of has to do with self-preservation. It's talking about what's natural, what is instinctive. And what Paul says there by inspiration is, it's natural for a man, if he's hungry, to eat, right? It's natural for a man, if he's sleepy, to go to bed. If it's natural for a man, if he is in a dangerous situation, to get away from it. I mean, those are natural self-preservation characteristics of humankind. And so then it follows. If that's what's natural for me, then that should flow toward my wife as well. That's the way I should be toward her. What that means is domestic violence is both unnatural and a violation of what God says I'm supposed to be toward my spouse or for that matter anybody else in my life. I mean what that means is it being unnatural there's no excuse for it. There's no reason for it and no matter how much the wife or the husband whoever is being abused no matter how much they blame themselves it's not them. It's the unnatural abuser. Go to Matthew 7. Matthew chapter 7, and, and this will be on the board too. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 12. Jesus says, Therefore, whatever you want men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And this passage is often referred to as the golden rule. Well, it's a command. I mean, Jesus is giving a command, and I think it's kind of abused today too. Uh, I remember being young, and when my dad would try to teach me how I was supposed to act toward somebody that had angered me or whatever, and he'd say, uh, you know, are you practicing the golden rule? And i say, well, it says, the, you know, treat others the way you want to be treated. I don't care how they treat me. So that gives me an excuse to treat them bad, right? That's not what this passage says. This talks about the way that people should be treated. Not necessarily the, bad, the way I want them to be treated, but the way God wants them to be treated. The way that they should be be treated. And what he says is, that's a summation of the law and the prophets. He said, that's what this is about. 
You take all of the law, including the foundation, which was the Ten Commandments, and you see how they relate to our relationship to God and our relationship to each other? And it's about acting the way that God wants us to act. So anybody who feels that it's okay for them to abuse their spouse or their children or their parents or whatever, basically what they're saying is, that's what I deserve. And so that's the way I act toward others. But that's not what God wants. That's not what God says should be the case. And by the way, I've heard the excuses. I've tried to help people in situations like this before. And I've heard the excuses. I mean, doesn't the Bible say that my wife's supposed to submit to me? It does say that. But that is such an abused passage. That's such an abused passage. That's not, that's not God saying, look here, you're the boss and she's nothing. It's not what God said. What he said is you are the protector. You're the leader. You're the safety. You're the one that has to make sure that everybody under your care is taken care of. And she submits willingly because of that loving care. Well, that's a whole lot different than the way people like to use it, right? Oh, and by the way, I want to tell you this. For any husband who says, well, she's supposed to submit to me, so I'm going to do it. Anybody that says this, I want you to recognize the Bible never tells you that. Not one time does the Bible tell you to make sure that your wife submits to you. Not one time. That command is given to her. That's her relationship to God. And she can't do that unless you also fulfill your relationship to God which is to be a loving provider and safety. But the Bible says she belongs to me, so I can do anything I want to. Does it say that she belongs to you? Yeah, it does, but guess what? It also says you belong to her. How about this one? 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 4 says, The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Too many men stop there, but keep reading. And likewise, in other words, in the same way. So the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. And so if my argument is, well, I ought to be able to do anything I want to her, to her uh, that I, anything I want to do, I ought to be able to do to her. If that's my argument, then her argument could lo logically be anything I want to do to him, I can do to him. And what foolish reasoning that is. It's never right. It's never acceptable. So I want to be very blunt, just based on the passages that we've read. I just want to be very, very blunt, very, very clear, and that's this. If you are an abuser, if I see you abusing your spouse, whether you are a man or a woman, or if I see you abusing your children or your parents, no matter who you are, I'm going to turn you in because that's sinful. And it's wrong. And if I don't see you because you're good at keeping it secret, well, God's going to see you. And you will stand before your Creator one day. And He will be able to administer punishment that is not even close to what you're doing to your family. That's not even going to be close to what God can administer. Domestic violence is wrong. There's no excuse for it. And anybody who's practicing it, whether it's toward a husband, toward a wife, toward a child, or toward a parent, ought to fall into the hands of the law. So what do we do about it? What do Christians do about domestic violence? Well, first thing we've got to do is we've got to warn our children. We have to warn our sons and daughters before they marry. And we've got to be parents, which means we've got to pay attention We've got to know the people that they're around, and we've got to know what's happening in their relationships, and we have to ask the questions, and we've got to talk, have the difficult conversations. And I think this is especially true when you're talking about young women, because in our culture today, what we have is a situation set up where everything's a, a Hallmark movie or a romance novel, and so what ends up happening is we just look for this good-looking, handsome guy, and we don't think about anything else. I'm so glad my dad, my wife didn't have that. She didn't have that standard. But we just kind of dramatize everything and gloss it all over, and then we, we overlook the red flags. 
because of the romance. And we think our parents aren't in touch with real life, right? Parents got to warn them. Pay attention. Is somebody being possessive? Does somebody have to know every move that the other person makes? Are they demanding? Are they jealous? Are they controlling? Do they blow up and then take back, oh, I'm so sorry about it, then blow up again? Do they demean each other? Do they call each other names? Do they talk down about each other? Have they experienced or exhibited, rather, physical violence in any way? you got to pay attention to those things. And you say, well, that is so hard. That's so hard. I can't sit down and talk to my child about that. Well, if you don't, you might sit down with them someday and talk about going to the hospital and getting help for their injuries. Or your grandchildren might approach you one day with it. And the cycle continues, generation after generation after generation. So you got to get involved in your kid's life. Second, you have to stress that wisdom says that spouses need to be on the same spiritual journey. And the passage to use that is there is 2 Corinthians 6, 14, where Paul says, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, I'm going to be very blunt with you. That passage does not teach that you have to marry a Christian. I know a lot of preachers who say that. That's not right. That's not what this passage is talking about. But what this passage is doing is giving a principle that says any situation you're in where the other individual that's being bound to you in this situation prevents you from being faithful to God is not a situation you need to be in. Now, if that's a work environment and you've got a boss that says you're not going to be, you're not going to be at worship ever, you say, well, then you're not going to be my boss. That's the way it works. But it is applicable to our relationships. Now, am I saying that if you're a Christian, you can't marry a non-Christian? I'm not saying that. Am I saying that if you're a Christian, you can't remain married to a non-Christian? I'm not saying that. 1 Corinthians 7 actually has people that are Christians married to non-Christian and says you live up to your responsibility to God and each other. You do what's right. You made a promise. You live up to it. Well, if you can live up to it, becoming a Christian in it, then you can live up to it whether they ever are a Christian, can you not? So what I'm talking about is a first line of defense that says, look, at the very least, this person that's going to be with me for the rest of my life, I'm going to try to get them to worship. And I'm going to try to get them to Bible class, and I'm going to see if we can at least get on the same direction, at least get on the same page. Because the bottom line is, Marriage is hard enough. If there's a marriage here this morning that has been nothing but perfect days of leaping from mountaintop to mountaintop to mountaintop, I wish you'd raise your hand. I'd like to talk to you later. No, it hasn't been. It's been a challenge, all of them. Well, if it's already a challenge, why make it harder? Pay attention. Of course, this brings a question up. I mean, are you insulated? If you marry a Christian, does that mean you're immune to this problem? Well, unfortunately, no, that does not mean that either. People can be imposters sometimes. People can be hypocrites. They can pretend to be something that they are not until you get in a home with them. Or somebody can be a Christian for many years and then just walk away from God, not live that, the way that they should as a Christian anymore. I'm not talking about immunity. I'm talking about defense. I'm talking about doing everything that I can to recognize that this person that I'm going to be spending the rest of my life with, that I actually know who that person is. And that I'm trying to connect them to God. What's well, hard, isn't it? It's hard to talk to your children about things like that, isn't it? It is hard. But it's harder to live in an abusive relationship. So what about the abuser? I mean, I've been talking pretty hard about the abuser, haven't I? Well, I've got some more hard things to say. Uh, you got to stop. You've got to stop. And if you're unwilling to stop, you need to suffer the consequences of your actions. What about the abused? Well, if you're the abused, protect yourself. Maybe you need to go to a safe place. Maybe you need to get your children to a safe place. If the person abusing you is a Christian, go talk to the elders. 
Get some help. Get somebody to stand on your side and protect you. If you're the abuser, you repent. That's the good news. I've been hard. Here's the good news. Repent. By the way, that doesn't mean be sorry that you did it. That means quit doing it. Get some help. Repent and turn away from these sinful actions. Stop being the bully and start submitting to God. Okay, that's, that's long enough. There's no, ju- no justification for domestic violence ever. Ever. And the person who practices it is a sinner and a lawbreaker, and they should be brought to justice. And if you're not brought to justice here in eternity, I promise you that God can do it. And I think maybe you ought to hear the words of Hebrews 10.32, where the Hebrews writer said, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. A fearful thing. Isn't it amazing that we have God described for us in the Scriptures as being love? Not that He acts loving or that he knows how to love. It's that he is love. And then the Hebrews writer says, but it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of God. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about being lost. He's talking about being lost. And whoever you are who's here this morning, if you're lost, doesn't matter why, doesn't matter what, doesn't matter who you've been, what matters is who he is. And so if you walk away from that condition of being lost, and you walk to Him in His way. If you believe Jesus is the Son of God, if you turn away from your sins into repentance, that means stop living that life. Confess His name before man. Be buried in baptism. The blood of Jesus, guess what? Is so powerful, it can wash away every sin, including abuse. And if you're a Christian who's Turn back to the devil's ways. You've gone back to the world. You can't stay there. You cannot stay there because you will fall into the hands of God.